welcome to a half hour of Mind Webs. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. The first story is from the book Science Fiction for People Who Hate Science Fiction, edited by Terry Carr. It's The Man with English by H.L. Gold. Lying in the hospital, Edgar Stone added up his misfortunes as another might count blessings. There were enough to infuriate the most temperate man, which Stone notoriously was not. He smashed his fist down, accidentally hitting the metal side of the bed, and was astonished by the pleasant feeling. It enraged him even more. The really maddening thing was how simply he had goaded himself into the hospital. He'd locked up his dry goods store and driven home for lunch. Nothing unusual about that. He did it every day. With his miserable digestion, he couldn't stand the restaurant food in town. He pulled into the driveway, rode over a collection of metal shapes his son Arnold had left lying around, and punctured a tire. Rita, this is going too damn far. Now, where is that brat? I'm in here. He kicked open the screen door. His foot went through the mesh. A ripped tire and a torn screen. He shouted at Arnold, who was sprawled in angular adolescence over a blueprint on the kitchen table. You'll pay for them, by God. They're coming out of your allowance. I'm sorry, Pop. Sorry, my left foot. You could have watched where you were going. He promised to clean up his things from the driveway right after lunch. And it's about time you stopped kicking the door open every time you were mad. Mad? Well, who wouldn't be mad? Me, hoping he'd get out of school and come into the store. And all he wants to do is become an engineer. An engineer, and he can't even make change when he <laughs> helps me out in the store. He'll be whatever he wants to be. Please, I can't concentrate on this plan. Edgar Stone was never one to restrain an angry impulse. He tore up the blueprint and flung the pieces down on the table. Oh, Pop. Don't say oh, Pop to me. You're not going to waste a summer vacation on junk like this. You'll eat your lunch and come down to the store, and you'll do it every day for the rest of the summer. Oh, we will, Willie catch up on his studies. And as for you, you can go back and eat in the restaurant. You know I can't stand that slop. You'll eat it because you're not having lunch here anymore. I've got enough to do without making three meals a day. But I can't drive back with that tire. He did, though not with a tire. He took a cab. It cost a dollar plus tip. Lunch was a dollar and a half plus tip. Buy carb at the right drugstore a few doors away. And in a great hurry, came to another 15 cents. Only it didn't work. And then, Miss Ellis came in for some material. Miss Ellis could round out any miserable day. She was 50, tall, skinny, and had thin, disapproving lips. She had a sliver of cloth clipped very meagerly off a hem that she intended to use as a sample. The arms of the slip cover on my reading chair wore through. I bought the material here, if you remember. Uh, that was about seven years ago. Six and a half. I paid enough for it. You'd expect anything that expensive to last. The style was discontinued. Uh, I have something here, Miss Ellis. I do not want to make an entire slipcover, Mr. Stone. All I want is enough to make new panels for the arms. Two yards should do very nicely. Mm, two yards, Miss Ellis? At the most. Uh, I sold the last of that material years ago. I want this same pattern. Well, then I'll have to order it and uh, just hope that one of my wholesalers still has some of it in stock. Not without looking for it first right here. You won't order it for me. You can't know all the materials you have on these shelves. Stone felt all the familiar symptoms of fury. The sudden pulsing of the temples, the lurch and bump of his heart as adrenaline came surging in like the tide at the Firth of Forth. The quivering of his hands, the angry shout pulsing at his vocal cords from below. I'll take a look, Miss Ellis. She was president of the Ladies' Cultural Society and dominated it so thoroughly that the members would go clear to the next town for their dry goods rather than deal with him if he offended this sour stick of stubbornness. If Stone's life insurance salesman had been there, he would have tried to keep Stone from climbing the ladder that ran around the three walls of the store. He probably wouldn't have been in time. Stone stamped up the ladder to reach the highest shelves where there were scraps of bolts. One of them might have been the remnant of the material Miss Ellis had bought six and a half years ago. But Stone never found out. He snatched one, glaring down, meanwhile, at the top of Miss Ellis's head, and the ladder skidded out from under him. He felt his skull collide with the counter. He didn't feel it hit the floor. God damn it, you could at least turn on the lights. There, there, Edgar. Everything's gonna be fine. Just fine. 
spine. Uh, what's what's wrong with me? Am I blind? How many fingers am I holding up? Stone was peering into the blackness. All he could see before his eyes was a vague blot against a darker blot. Uh, none. Uh, who, who are you? Dr. Rankin. Uh, that was a nasty fall you had, Mr. Stone. A concussion, of course, and a splinter of bone driven into the brain. I had to operate to remove it. Well, then you cut out a nerve. You did something to my eyes. There doesn't seem to be anything wrong with him. I'll, I'll take a look, though, and uh, see. Now, dear, you're going to be all right. Sure you will, Pop. Is that young stinker here? He's the cause of all this. Temper, temper. Accidents happen, Mr. Stone. Stone heard him lower the Venetian blinds. As if they had been a switch, light sprang up, and everything in the hospital became brightly visible. Well, that's more like it. It's, it's night, and you're trying to save electricity, right? It's broad daylight, Edgar, dear. All Dr. Rankin did was lower the blinds and... Please, please, if you don't mind, I'd rather take care of any explanations that have to be made. He came at Stone with an ophthalmoscope. And when he flashed it into Stone's eyes, everything went black, and Stone let him know it vociferously. Uh, black? Are you positive? And not a sudden glare? Black. And what's the idea of putting me in a bed filled with breadcrumbs? Why, well, it was freshly made. Crumbs. That's right, you heard me, and the pillow's got rocks in it. Uh, what else is bothering you? It's freezing in here. It was summer when I fell off the ladder. Don't tell me I've been unconscious clear through to winter. No, Pop, that was yesterday. I'll take care of this. I'm afraid you and your son will have to leave, Mrs. Stone. I, I have to do a few tests on your husband. Uh, will he be all right? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, shock, you know. Gosh, Pop, I'm sorry all this happened. I got the driveway all cleaned up. And we'll take care of the store, Ed, till you're better. Uh, don't you dare. You, you'll put me out of business. The doctor hastily shut the door on them and came back to the bed. Stone was clutching the light summer blanket around himself. He felt colder than he'd ever been in his life. Uh, can't you get me more blankets? You don't want me to die of pneumonia, do you? Dr. Rankin opened the blinds and asked, uh, What's this like? Night. Uh, what is it, a new idea to save electricity, hooking up the blinds to the light switch? The doctor closed the blinds and sat down beside the bed. He was sweating as he reached for the signal button and pressed it. A nurse came in, blinking in their direction. Why don't you turn on the light? Huh? Uh, they are. Nurse, I'm Dr. Rankin. Uh, get me a piece of uh, sandpaper, uh, some cotton swabs, Let's see. Uh, oh, and an ice cube and uh, Mr. Stone's lunch. Is there anything he shouldn't eat? Uh, that's what I want to find out, nurse. Uh, now hurry, please. And some blankets. Blankets, doctor? Uh, half a dozen will do, I, I think. It took her ten minutes to return with all the items. Stone wanted them to keep adding blankets until seven were on him. And he still felt cold. Uh, maybe some hot coffee. The doctor nodded, and the nurse poured a cup, added the spoon and a half of sugar he requested, and he took a mouthful. He sprayed it out violently. Ice cold! And who put salt in it? Salt? It's so dark in here. Uh, I'll attend to it, nurse. Uh, thank you. She walked cautiously to the door and went out. Try this, said the doctor after filling another cup. Well, uh, that's better. Damn practical joker. They shouldn't be allowed to work in hospitals. And now, if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, try several tests. Stone was still angry at the trick played on him, but he cooperated willingly. Dr. Rankin finally sagged back in the chair. The sweat ran down his face and into his collar, and his expression was so dazed that Stone was alarmed. Uh, what's wrong, Doctor? Am I going to, you know, am I going to... No, no, it's not that. No danger. Uh, at least I don't believe there is, but I can't even be sure of that anymore. You can't be sure if I'll live or die? Uh, look, it's, it's broad daylight, and yet you can't see until I darken the room. The coffee was hot and sweet, but it, it was cold and salty to you, so... I added an ice cube and a spoonful of salt, and then it tasted fine, you said. And, Mr. Stone, this is one of the hottest days of the year, and you're freezing. 
and you told me the sandpaper felt smooth and satiny. Then you yelled that somebody had put pens in the cotton swabs when there weren't any, of course. I've tried you with different colors around the room, and you saw violet when you should have seen yellow, green for red, orange for blue, and so on. Uh, now do you understand? Uh, no. Uh, what's wrong, Doc? Well, all I can do is guess. I had to remove that sliver of bone from your brain, and, well, it apparently shorted your sensory nerves. And what happened? Every one of your senses has apparently been reversed. You feel cold for heat, a heat for cold, smooth for rough, and rough for smooth, sour for sweet, and sweet for sour, and so forth, Mr. Stone, and, and you see colors backward. Murderer, you thief, you've ruined me! The doctor sprang for a hypodermic and sedative. Just in time, he changed his mind and took a bottle of stimulant instead. It worked fine, though injecting it into a screaming, thrashing patient took more strength than he'd known he owned. Stone fell asleep immediately. Now there were nine blankets on Stone, and he had a bag of cement for a pillow. When he had his lawyer, Manny Lubin, in to hear the charges that he wanted brought against Dr. Rankin... The doctor was there to defend himself, and Mrs. Stone was present in spite of her husband's objections. Well, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Lubin. I, I've hunted for cases like this in medical history, and uh, this is the first one ever to be reported. Uh, well, except I actually haven't reported it yet. I'm hoping it'll reverse itself. That sometimes uh, happens, you know. And what am I supposed to do in the meantime? I'll have to go out wearing an overcoat in the summer and shorts in the winter, and people will think I'm a maniac or something. And they'll be sure of it because I'll, I'll have to keep the store closed during the day and open at night. I can't see except in the dark and matching materials. I can't stand the feel of smooth cloth and I see colors backward. How would you like to have to put sugar on your food and salt in your coffee? But we'll work it out, Edgar, dear. Arnold and I can take care of the store. You always wanted him to come into the business, so that ought to please you. As long as I'm there to watch him, it will. And Dr. Rankin said maybe things will straighten out. Well, uh, what about that, Doctor? As his attorney, I'm interested in what are Stone's chances. I, I don't know. I, this has never happened before. All, all we can do is hope. I hope nothing. I want to sue him. He's got no right to go meddling around and turn me upside down. Any jury would give me a quarter of a million. Oh, I, I'm no millionaire, Mr. Stone. But the hospital has money. We'll sue you and the trustees. Well, I'm afraid we wouldn't have a case, Mr. Stone. It was an emergency operation, and any surgeon would have had to operate. Am I right, Dr. Rankin? The doctor explained what would have happened if he had not removed the pressure on the brain resulting from the concussion and the danger that the bone splinter, if not extracted, might have gone on traveling and caused possible paralysis or death. Now that'd be better than this. But medical ethics couldn't allow him to let you die, Mr. Stone. He was doing his duty. That's uh, point one. Mr. Lubin is absolutely right, Edgar. There, you see, every, everybody's right but me. W will you get her out of here before I have a stroke? Her interests are also involved. And point two is that the emergency came first. The after effects couldn't be known or considered. Any operation involves risk, even the... Even the excising of a corn. I had to take those risks. You had to take them? Uh, all right, what are you leading up to, Lubin? Well, uh, what I mean to say, Mr. Stone, is that we'd lose. Yeah, so we'd lose, but if we sue, the publicity would ruin him. I want to sue. For what, Edgar, dear? We'll have a hard enough time managing. Why throw good money after bad? Now, why didn't I marry a woman who'd take my side, even when I'm wrong? Revenge, that's what. And he won't be able to practice, so he'll have time to find out if there is a cure. And at no charge either, I won't pay him another cent. Well, I'm willing to see what can be done right now. And it wouldn't cost you anything, naturally. What do you mean? Why, if I were to perform another operation, I'll be able to see which nerves were involved. There's no need to go into the technical side of it right now, but it is possible to connect nerves. Of course, there are a good many which complicates things, but the splinter went through several layers, you must remember. 
Are uh, you offering to attempt to correct the injury, the greatest? Certainly. I, I mean to say I'll do my absolute best. But uh, keep in mind, please, that there is no medical precedent. Well, in view of the fact that we have no legal grounds, whatever, for suit, uh, does this offer of settlement satisfy uh, your claim against him, Mr. Stone? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I guess so. Well, then it's in your hands, Doctor. I'll have him prepared for surgery right away. It better work this time, Stone warned, clutching a handful of ice cubes to warm his fingers. Stone came to foggily. He didn't know it, but he had given the anesthetist a bewildering problem which finally had been solved by using fumes of aromatic spirits of ammonia. Now four blurred figures around the bed seemed to be leaning precariously toward him. Hey, hey, Pop. Pop, look, look, he's coming out of it. Pop! Edgar? Uh, Speak to me, Edgar, dear. See how, see how he is, Doctor. Oh, he's fine. Uh, he must be. The blinds are open and he's not complaining that it's dark or that he's cold. Uh, how are we feeling, Mr. Stone? It took a minute or two for Stone to move his swollen tongue enough to answer. And he wrinkled his nose in disgust and demanded, Uh, what smells purple? That story was titled The Man with English, written by H.L. Gold. One of the places it appears is in Terry Carr's book, Science fiction for people who hate science fiction. Joining me in the reading and providing the women's voices were Jay Fitz, Carol Cowan, and Mindy Ratner. The second story this time comes from Roger Zelazny's book, The Doors of His Face, The Lamps of His Mouth, and Other Stories. The title is Lucifer. Carlson stood on the hill in the silent center of the city whose people had died. He stared up at the building, the one structure that dwarfed every hotel grid, skyscraper needle, or apartment cheese box packed into all the miles that lay about him. Carlson suddenly felt that he should not have come back. It had been over two years, as he figured it, since last he had been here. He wanted to return to the mountains now. One look was enough. Yet still he stood before it, transfixed by the huge building, by the long shadow that bridged the entire valley. He shrugged his thick shoulders then in an unsuccessful attempt to shake off memories of the days five, or was it six, years ago when he had worked within the giant unit. Then he climbed the rest of the way up the hill and entered the high, wide doorway. His fiber sandals cast a variety of echoes as he passed through the deserted offices and into the long hallway that led to the belts. The belts, of course, were still. There were no thousands riding them. There was no one alive to ride. Their deep belly rumble was only a noisy phantom in his mind as he climbed onto the one nearest him and walked ahead into the pitchy insides of the place. It was like a mausoleum, there seemed no ceiling, no walls, only the soft pat-pat of his soles on the flexible fabric of the belt. When he reached the lift, he set off to the right of it until his memory led him to the maintenance stairs. Shouldering his bundle, he began the long, groping ascent. He blinked at the light when he came into the power room. Filtered through its hundred high windows, the sunlight trickled across the dusty acres of machinery. He brushed his hair from his eyes and advanced down the narrow metal stair to where the generators stood row on row like an army of dead black beetles. It took him six hours to give them all a cursory check. He selected three in the second row and systematically began tearing them down, cleaning them, soldering their loose connections with the auto iron, greasing them, oiling them, and sweeping away all the dust, the cobwebs, and pieces of cracked insulation that lay at their bases. Finally, he put down his broom, remounted the stair, and returned to his parcel. He removed one of the water bottles and drank off half its contents. He ate a piece of dried meat and finished the bottle. He allowed himself one cigarette then and returned to work. It took him two more days to get the generators ready. Then he began work on the huge broadcast panel. 
It was in better condition than the generators because it had last been used two years ago. Whereas the generators, say for the three it burned out last time, had slept for over five, or was it six, years. He soldered and wiped and inspected until he was satisfied. Then only one task remained. All the maintenance robots stood frozen in mid-gesture. Carlson would have to wrestle a 300-pound power cube without assistance. If he could get one down from the rack and onto a cart without breaking a wrist, he would probably be able to convey it to the igniter without much difficulty. Then he would have to place it within the oven. He had almost ruptured himself when he did it two years ago, but he hoped that he was somewhat stronger and luckier this time. It took him ten minutes to clean the igniter oven. Then he located a cart and pushed it back to the rack. One cube was resting at just the right height, approximately eight inches above the level of the cart's bed. He kicked on anchor chocks and moved around to study the rack. The cube lay on a downward slanting shelf, restrained by a two-inch metal guard. He pushed at the guard. It was bolted to the shelf. Returning to the work area, he searched the toolboxes for a wrench. Then he moved back to the rack and set to work on the nuts. The guard came loose as he was working on the fourth nut. He heard a dangerous creak and threw himself back out of the way, dropping the wrench on his toes. The cube slid forward, crushed the loosened rail, teetered a bare moment, and then dropped with a resounding crash onto the heavy bed of the cart. The bed surface bent and began to crease beneath its weight. The cart swayed toward the outside. The cube continued to slide until over half a foot projected beyond the edge, and then... Then the cart righted itself and shivered into steadiness. Gingerly, he guided it up the aisle and between the rows of generators until he stood before the igniter. He anchored the cart again, stopped for water and a cigarette, then searched up a pinch bar, a small jack, and a long flat metal plate. He laid the plate to bridge the front end of the cart in the opening to the oven. He wedged the far end in beneath the igniter's door frame. Unlocking the rear chocks, he inserted the jack and began to raise the back end of the wagon slowly, working with one hand and holding the bar ready in the other. The cart groaned as it moved higher. Then a sliding, grating sound began, and he raised it faster. With a sound like the stroke of a cracked bell, the cube tumbled onto the bridgeway. It slid forward and to the left. He struck at it with a bar, bearing to the right with all his strength. About half an inch of it caught against the left edge of the oven frame. The gap between the cube and the frame was widest at the bottom. He inserted the bar and heaved his weight against it three times. Then it moved forward and came to rest within the igniter. He began to laugh. He laughed until he felt weak. He sat on the broken cart swinging his legs and chuckling to himself until the sounds coming from his throat seemed alien and out of place. He stopped abruptly and slammed the door. The broadcast panel had a thousand eyes, but none of them winked back at him. He made the final adjustments for transmit, and then gave the generators their last checkout. After that, he mounted a catwalk and moved to a window. There was still some daylight to spend, so he moved from window to window, pressing the open button set below each sill. He ate the rest of his food then and drank a whole bottle of water and smoked two cigarettes. Sitting on the stair, he thought of the days when he had worked with Kelly and Murchison and Dajinsky, twisting the tails of electrons until they wailed and leapt out over the walls and fled down into the city. The clock. He remembered it suddenly, set high on the wall to the left of the doorway, frozen at 9.33 and 48 seconds. He moved a ladder through the twilight and mounted it to the clock. He wiped the dust from its greasy face with a sweeping circular movement, and then he was ready. He crossed to the igniter and turned it on. Somewhere the ever batteries came alive, and he heard a click as a thin, sharp shaft was driven into the wall of the cube. He raced up the stairs and sped hand over hand up to the catwalk. He moved to a window and waited. God, he murmured, don't let him blow, please don't. Across an eternity of darkness, the generators began humming. He heard a crackle of static from the broadcast panel and he closed his eyes. The sound died. He opened his eyes as he heard the window slide upward. All around him, the hundred high windows opened. 
A small light came on above the bench in the work area below him, but he did not see it. He was staring out beyond the wide drop of the Acropolis and down into the city, his city. The lights were not like the stars. They beat the stars all to hell. They were the gay, regularized constellation of a city where men made their homes. Even rows of street lamps, advertisements, lighted windows in the cheese box apartments, a random solitaire of bright squares running up the sides of skyscraper needles. A searchlight swiveling its luminous antenna through cloud banks that hung over the city. He dashed to another window, feeling the high night breezes comb at his beard. Belts were humming below. He heard their wry monologues rattling through the city's deepest canyons. He pictured the people in their homes and theaters and bars, talking to each other, sharing a common amusement, playing clarinets, holding hands, eating an evening snack. Sleeping road cars awakened and rushed past each other in the levels above the belts. The background hum of the city told him its story of production, of function, of movement, and service to its inhabitants. The sky seemed to wheel overhead as though the city were its turning hub in the universe, its outer rim. Then the lights dimmed from white to yellow, and he hurried with desperate steps to another window. No, no, not so soon. Don't leave me yet, he sobbed. The windows closed themselves, and the lights went out. He stood on the walk for a long time, staring at the dead embers. A smell of ozone reached his nostrils. He was aware of a blue halo about the dying generators. He descended and crossed the work area to the ladder he had set against the wall. Pressing his face against the glass and squinting for a long time, he could make out the position of the hands. 9.35 and 21 seconds, Carlson read. Do you hear that? He called out, shaking his fist at anything. 93 seconds. I made you live for 93 seconds. Then he covered his face against the darkness and was silent. After a long while, he descended the stairway, walked the belt, and moved through the long hallway and out of the building. As he headed back toward the mountains, he promised himself again that he would never return. That story was titled Lucifer. It comes from the book The Doors of His Face, The Lamps of His Mouth, and Other Stories by Roger Zelazny. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Technical production for MindWebs by Leslie Hilsenhoff and Steve Gordon. MindWebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.